a long-term trend that you were on very early, which is now sort of flavor, maybe not even of the month, flavor of the decade, is Asia. What are you seeing in Asia now? Well, all the creditor nations in the world, basically the largest creditor nations in the world are China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. I mean, that's where the assets are. That's where the money is. And you know who Middle the East? Well, well, they're in Asia. I mean, you know, Saudi Arabia's in Asia. Um, that's where the, the money is. That's where the assets are. And you know who the debtors are, and you know where the debtors are. Uh, there's an enormous amount of vibrancy in Asia. Everybody still works very hard. They save and invest huge amounts of their income, and they, and they work for the future. It's not quite the same as it is here in the West. I mean, it used to be this way, and you know, when I was growing up in the U.S., there was a lot of this, this kind of We've attitude. gotten lazier in the West than when you were growing up? <laughs> well, I certainly have the impression that things are m not the way they were when I was growing up, yes. And I think the statistics probably bear that out. What about the concerns of, a, of bubbles now, asset bubbles in China, maybe in particular in real estate? Are you worried about that? Well, of course, I'm always worried about any kind of bubble. And in my view, there is a certainly a potential and maybe even a, a present bubble in urban coastal real estate in China. Not all Chinese real estate by any stretch, but urban coastal real estate. I mean, Hong Kong prices are really, really high. Shanghai, Guangzhou, a few places like that. So yes, I'm very worried about it. But even if it pops, it, let's say there is a bubble and it pops, it's not going to end the Chinese economy. That urban real, coastal real estate bubble is a price bubble. Uh, prices are too high. It's not like here. We had a credit bubble in the U.S. We had people buying four or five houses with no job, no money down, and then they bought more houses. And then the bankers took it and turned these little things into these beautiful little credit uh, instruments. And the whole thing was it was a huge, huge, per perhaps the biggest credit bubble in the history of the world. The biggest I've ever read about anyway. Uh, so that's and the biggest different. of your career? Oh, certainly the biggest of my career. Uh, no, no, sir, I'm, I'm talking about history. I've never read about one like this in history. Um, so that kind of huge credit bubble is certainly different from a price bubble, which seems to be what's happening in China. If, if people go bankrupt, if real estate speculators go bankrupt in China, it's not going to bring down the Chinese economy. In the U.S., and we saw this particularly vividly during the midterms, we're seeing China become somewhat of a bogeyman and China being painted by both the right and the left as the culprit in America's economic problems, with particular focus on the undervalued Chinese currency. Is that a fair assessment of what's going on in the world? What, the politicians are finding somebody else to blame? <laughs> of course that's a fair assessment. It always happens. Whatever country you're talking about, any time in history, when things go wrong, politicians always blame two groups, three groups of people. They always blame the foreigners, because the foreigners don't vote, the foreigners aren't there, they have different languages, different religion, their food smells bad, they smell Chinese bad. Chinese food smells bad? No, no. I'm telling what politicians always say about foreigners. Then they start saying, oh, and their food smells bad. And then they say, the people smell bad, all those foreigners. Whatever kind of foreigners there are, politicians always blame foreigners. And that's what's the going on with the China story? That's, yes, the other group that they always, just so you know, the other group that they always blame are bankers, financiers, Nobody likes financiers when things go wrong. They blame all their problems on bankers. So foreigners, bankers, and the third group they always complain about are journalists. Because if the journalists didn't write about these problems, we wouldn't have the problems. So it's, but this is nothing new. It happens for thousands of years. This is the way politicians react. So when you say, is it a fair assessment, it's a fair assessment that that's the way they're acting. Blaming the, our problems on China is not the solution. Yeah, I, look, I think that China should let its currency go float free. If I were China, I would let the currency float this afternoon. And, and what's, what's holding them back? Well, there are many people in China who think that it, if they do that, that some parts of the Chinese economy will suffer. Now, for whatever reason, they are overlooking the fact that many parts of the Chinese economy would thrive, would, would benefit if they let the currency uh, be convertible. For whatever reason, the people who think that they would suffer have more power than the people who realize that they would be better off. This is one of the mistakes that I think the Chinese have made and are making. I didn't think they would let it, would hold it this long. 
you know, I public, I think it was at Thomson Reuters where I was interviewed once, and I said, oh, by 2008, the Chinese currency will be convertible. Shows how much I know. Uh, but I think this is, they should let it go, or, but who knows when they will, if they will. And do you agree with the view that the Chinese are gradually moving in that direction, gradually oh, there's no moving question about towards that. No, no, and, and it doesn't make the press very much, and it's certainly not the Western press. You know, it is convertible with some of the neighbors now. You can trade with the Vietnamese or the Russians or the Malaysians. There's even a Thompson Reuters product, believe it or not. There's a what? There's even a Thompson Reuters product to help them do that. Oh, well, see, see, I should come to Thompson Reuters more often. No, they are, they are trade. Hong Kong, is, it's almost essentially freely convertible. You can use the renminbi in, in shops in Hong Kong now. No, they've certainly opened up an enormous amount. They have swap, currency swaps with some of their neighboring countries. It's happening. It's not as happening as fast as I would do it, but I don't vote in China. I don't have a say-so in China. Can I ask you to predict when there'll be full convertibility? I told you, 2008. Uh, okay, let's let's not do the past prediction, but the future one. Why Are you going to take a risk? To me? I was wrong about it the first time. I, Some people will. Just to give it a try. It's becoming more and more convertible. 2012, just well, in time for the U.S. election. You're talking about fully convertible? Yeah. Like the the euro or the Australian dollar or something like that. I would probably say by 2013, but I mean this I was is, just one year off. But this That's is an absurd uh, the projection for me because it's opening slowly. It's happening. Uh, I mean, I own the renminbi. It's full disclosure. I own the renminbi, and every time I can, I buy more renminbi. There are legal ways to buy the renminbi. I mean, it's not like buying the euro, but uh, I buy whenever I can because it's becoming more and more convertible. And how about another China issue we hear about a lot from Washington and also uh, from some European capitals, uh, which is this issue of Chinese domestic demand and the notion that you really need Chinese domestic demand to increase to see a strong global economic recovery. Do you well, buy that? Well, I, I certainly don't buy that Washington, D.C. can tell somebody how to run an economy. Are you kidding? As recently as 1987, we were a creditor nation. Now we're the largest debtor nation. We're not just the largest debtor nation in the world. We're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. So you think those guys in Washington should tell anybody how to run an economy? Oh, please, you're bad for my nervous system. No, okay, what, what about the essential not. point, though, if it were made by a Martian, say, that Chinese domestic demand needs to increase? Well, Chinese, first of all, the way you build an economy, a thriving, growing economy, is you have high savings and high investment. That's what the Chinese have. That's the way you build a long-term economy. That's what we did. Someone has to consume, though, right? Eventually, yes, but first you have, you save and invest investment in product, productive capacity is what leads to long-term growth of an economy. You don't build an economy by everybody, by going to the disco every Saturday night. That's not the way you build a long-term growing economy. You save, you invest, you build productive capacity, and from that comes internal growth and internal consumption eventually. But you don't just sit down and say, okay, all you guys have saved 35 percent of your income. Let's stop investing for the future. Let's all go to the disco every Saturday night. Let's spend it on new cars and new TVs. That, that, yeah, that's wonderful for a while, but that does not build a long-term sound economy. If we see every nation, though, pursuing that kind of an export-driven national economic I agenda, export -driven. aren't there going to be strains? Wait, 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 I didn't say export. You said production, said but where, 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 if everyone is saving and producing, where are all those goods going to go? Who's well, gonna you build them? factories, you build highways, you build schools, you build, you build uh, transportation. All of that leads to cheaper internal consumption, and eventually, yes, people grow. The people who build the roads you know, buy beds, they buy clothes, they buy houses. No, this eventually, it all grows. As long as they're not going to the disco, it's okay? <laughs> they can even go to the disco if they want to, uh, once, once a month. Uh, I'll let them go to the disco <laughs> once a month. Uh, no, but this, this is the way, look at the way America grew. That's how America grew. We saved, invested huge amounts of money. Uh, we borrowed a lot of money. We were a debtor for a while, but the money we borrowed went into railroads and canals and productive capacity. Then we became a creditor nation. We became the most successful creditor nation in the 20th century, and things were great. And we all consumed, and we had homes and cars and the rest of it. That's the way it's supposed to work. But sitting down and saying, okay, you people stop saving now, stop building highways, stop investing for the future, and start consuming. You can do it, but it doesn't lead to long-term growth. Not everyone can be a creditor nation at the same time, though. How That's do you correct. get a global balance? What's, what's the right way? 
Well, one way, unfortunately, since the way things are building up, you have credit, currency crises. And we're going to have more currency crises. We've been having currency problems and currency crises. You mentioned Iceland before. Well, there are more coming. Uh, that's, it used to be in the old days when we had the gold standard. The gold would flow from the creditors to the debtors, or, and then back from the creditors, or the, from the debtors to the, to the creditors. And then the system would balance itself. We don't have those kind of automatic adjustment uh, mechanisms anymore. And so you're going to see more currency crises. It will be resolved, if you consider that a resolution, in the currency markets.